All right. <clears throat> and I see the yep. clock. Uh, I want to finish up. I'm going to finish up one message, hopefully this morning, and start another one. So this is unusual. <laughs> but uh, we kind of, sometimes we get off in tangents, which is good. I don't have a problem with that. I'm glad when you raise your hand and bring up something. Because I think it's, it's more important for you to go home satisfied than for me to have completed my message. Because I can always carry it on the next week. Now we are talking about everything being a test. This is a very important subject. So we'll go back to 2 Corinthians 13. I think it's always good to reread our verse. We'll just read verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. <clears throat> I think Daniel's thinking, tests. I hate tests. <laughs> and uh, I think sometimes the school, school tests are not the most pleasant thing to have to go through. He's but too smart. <laughs> you still have to go through them. And by the way, testing never, as we've said, testing never really stops in life. It's not like you say, well, phew, I'm glad I don't ever have to go through any more tests. You, you have to take, every so many years, I think you have to take the, the driving test. Mm -hmm. Maybe well, when you get so, so old, you have to take a driving test. Before Where the are we yet in second? Uh, 13, chapter 13 and verse 5. Examine okay. yourself. Okay. Examine yeah. Yourself. Examine yourself. Examine. Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. On you. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? To help us this morning, dear Lord, we pray to have a, a sober mind about this important subject. And we'll thank and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're, we're going through, we're finishing up uh, the issue of how we are tested. We talked about who tests us, what, what, how tests come about, but th this one is, this point we're making is how we're tested. Last week, the last point I made is we're tested, Paul was tested by a thorn in the flesh, he said, because Paul was taken up into the third heaven, People loved the Apostle. Well, he's kind of one of those love-hate guys. You either loved him or you hate him. But the people that loved Paul really loved him. And he was God was concerned that Paul would exalt himself. And so he says, A thorn was given in my flesh to keep me humble. And he said, I asked the Lord three times to remove it, and the Lord said no. So God doesn't always say yes. No, I won't remove that thorn in the flesh. My grace is sufficient for you. And Paul then turns it right backwards and says, Therefore will I glory in my weakness, my affliction, that Jesus Christ might be magnified or glorified. Amen? So Paul turned a negative into a positive. That's a good lesson for us. That we don't just say, well, you know, wham, 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 but turn a negative into a positive. How can we glorify God through the things in our life that aren't, you know, what we'd like to have happen? Now, the next point is we are tested by circumstances. This is a very common thing. And many times these circumstances are completely out of our control. We, had, we didn't do anything to bring about the set of circumstances. For instance, who's president of the United States, right? Who's the governor of Illinois? Who's the mayor of our city? We may have voted for the best candidate, but that doesn't mean that the best candidate always wins. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, of course, we know that politicians have a profound effect upon our lives, and mostly a negative effect upon Most of the time, it's a negative effect upon our lives. And our example is from uh, Daniel chapter 6. If you want to turn to the book of Daniel, this is the famous story of Daniel and the lion's den. Okay. Now, remember, Daniel is a unwilling alien in Babylon. He was forcibly taken from his homeland. We don't know anything about what happened to his parents, except that he... He and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and apparently other 
young men from Israel were taken to Babylon and put into a training program for bureaucrats, in essence, we would say. Yeah, chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6. They were put into a training uh, program for uh, bureaucrats. Now, you'll recall that initially Daniel was put to a test. Just as soon as he got there, he was offered the king's food. Remember this test? And he, he and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, uh-uh, we are not going to eat all this rich food and the wine. The king. They basically ate the same food the king ate. They were offered it. And uh, so Daniel said to the, their handler, look, put us to a test. Feed us bread and water. And one translation says vegetables and water for ten days. And then compare us to these other young men that have been eating this rich food. And if, if we're not at least as healthy looking as they are, then we'll, we'll give in and we'll eat the king's food. So he said, okay, I'll do it for ten days. Because the guy said, if you look sickly, I'm going to lose my head. The king's going to cut my head off. How would you like to have a political administration that that was the penalty? <laughs> this guy, was he was a frightened. Glad because, you brought that up. Because I had got a phone call a week ago to my nephew down in Arkansas. Yeah. And he said his son is so particular that he's he's got an honest diet and he's nothing but meat. So and I was telling him, I said, it's somewhere in the Bible, I can't really don't know where it's at about meat and vegetables. And yeah. Stuff. And but there's that, the story. Daniel, there it is. Right. So I'm gonna call him back and I'm gonna tell him where it's yeah, at. Yeah, Daniel. Then, of course, Daniel passes that test. He becomes, ultimately, uh, Babylon is overthrown by the Persians. And uh, Darius makes Daniel the number two man in the entire kingdom. We would call him the vice president, basically, in, in our system of government. He's, he's the most powerful, second most powerful man in the kingdom. And the men that he's got, a 120... Uh, bureaucrats underneath him that is report to him and they hate him think Donald Trump they hate him and they gather together to they realize he's a righteous godly man and they have guys spying on him right and the only thing they can report is that every day three times a day he goes to a window facing east and he prays to his God because he's a very devout, uh, righteous man. So they go to the king, and we'll start at verse, um, well, they go to the king and they convince him uh, to pass a law. Does anybody remember what the law said? couldn't worship anybody but Darius. Yeah, you couldn't pray to any god except the king for 30 days. They put a time limit on it because they, they probably had, they were hypocrites, they probably had some little god they would pray to too. Turn that down back there, would you please, dear? And turn the, just turn it so the flame goes down and turn the fan off and uh, that, thank you. And, um, so what does Daniel do? As soon as the Bible says, well, let's let's start reading. Uh, let's start at <clears throat> verse 10. Chap Daniel 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, now, so he, he was cognizant of what was going on. He's the number two guy. He couldn't have been in the dark. He knew why these men were doing it. You know, he wasn't stupid. They were. This was specifically made to get to Daniel. So I love this. As now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, which was would be east. Well, it actually would be west because Babylon was east of Jerusalem, so it was facing west. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying uh, and giving thanks before God as he had done previously. Nothing changed 
in Daniel's life. He didn't close the windows so they wouldn't be able to see him doing it. Got it? He left them open, inviting these men to basically find fault with him. I, I love that. And you know, in a sense, some sense, Donald Trump's kind of like that, isn't he? He knows how to poke his enemies. He knows there are certain words that when he says them, it sends these people over the edge. So you understand what... Now, Daniel didn't do it just to aggravate them. He did it because he was... Want, but he, want, he, he was not about to be ashamed of his faith. Remember what Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me in front of this adulterous and gen, uh, sinful generation, I'm going to be ashamed of you when I come before my Father and his holy angels. So Daniel wanted everybody to know this law is not going to change one thing I do regarding my faith. Amen? Amen. It's kind of like the apostles, when they called them in and said, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And they said, well, you have to judge whether it's right or not, but we're only going to tell you, we're not going to obey what you tell us. We're going to keep preaching in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So Daniel was sort of, that was what Daniel was saying. I don't care what your law says. I'm going to keep praying. And so this was his test, wasn't it? The test was... The circumstances dictated a test. Was Daniel going to close his windows? He, he could still have prayed with the windows closed. Having an open window didn't really mean anything. You know, it, it, most of us, I don't, I don't go in a window and pray so my neighbors can see me praying. I pray sitting down or kneeling at my bedside or, in the, you know, I just pray in the car. But I don't have a little sign that goes like the taxi cabs, vacant, you know, praying. So they don't put a sign out front praying. But that's what Daniel did. In essence, he had a sign. I'm praying. I'm in my window. I'm facing the west. I'm praying toward Jerusalem. <coughs> so circumstances will often test us. And you know, folks, you have to be wise. You have to be thinking ahead of uh, these circumstances and, and ask yourself, well, is this a test? Are these... What am I going to do under these circumstances? And of course, what was the outcome for Daniel? Well, when the king found out, he was faced with a real conundrum, wasn't he? He had, he, he had several options. He could have pardoned Daniel, but then in order to be pardoned, you have to admit you're guilty. And Daniel would never have done that, and that would have even been more embarrassing if Daniel had said, no, I don't, I don't accept the pardon. He could have admitted that he got duped, but then, if he did that, then all the kingdom would wonder if he's capable to rule over the kingdom. Now remember, the Medes and Persians had a law that said when you make a law, it cannot be reversed. So had he reversed it, he would have basically undone the entire government. He, it would have been the end of his reign. You, you understand the problem. So... The Bible says he all day long he had the Supreme Court, all the best lawyers in the land, trying to figure out how to get out of this. But in the end, they said, you got to throw him in the lion's den. Now, folks, I don't know about... We, it's a great story for us, but imagine if you were actually the guy who was going to be thrown in the lion... Or, or girl, woman, man or woman, if you were actually going to be thrown in the lion's den. You know, it's easy for us to read the story. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> And Daniel was a human being just like us. And uh, so in the end, no matter how Darius, was, how sorry he was, how he tried so hard to save Daniel, he had to throw him in the lion's den. So don't you think Daniel did a lot of praying? Oh yeah, I'm sure he did. Okay. I would, I'll tell you that. Well, yeah. And of course you better be ready to die. Right. Because you know, there is a such thing as a martyr. Not at, not, God does not always deliver you from right. death, especially under these kind of circumstances. Well, that's what Stephen did. He, right. And right. he looked up. And yeah. he, was, he was willing to give his life. And right. really, all Christians are willing to give their life. The question is, are you going to live for Jesus? A lot of people say, oh, I'll die for him. But are you going to really live for him? Right. So, of course, uh, Daniel is thrown in. And the king goes home. He's sorrowful. Bible says he no entertainment. He basically was up all night long, pacing the floor back and forth. 
You have to wonder if he wasn't doing some praying. Uh, what would he have prayed for? That he Daniel wouldn't... didn't die, because I think well, I think that Darius actually loved, you know, in a, in the in a, in a manly sort of a sense. He actually loved. He certainly admired and respected him more than he did anybody in his kingdom. But he wasn't a Christian. What would he have prayed no, for? No, but I'll lion? tell you what. He knew exactly who's Daniel Daniel's God was, because if you read what he said about it afterwards, mm -hmm. you know that he said there is no other God but the God of Daniel. There is no other. He's the only one. And of course he goes, the minute, the minute the first ray of sun came up over the horizon, Darius was right there at the mouth of the lion's den, and he cried out, O Daniel, has your God that you serve day and night delivered you? You got to kind of wonder if Daniel didn't poke one of those lions and make him roar down there. And maybe he just waited 10 seconds or so with silence. I don't know. But he says, My God sent an angel to close the mouth of these lions. So folks, circumstances will test your lives. And the question for you is, am I going to pass the test? Because we're all, we all, we're all going to be faced with circumstances of life. Every one of us. And we have been. I'm sure all of us can give cases where we have been. You know, Johanna died when she was 23 years old. That was a real test. And lots of people, they give up. They say, "Well, God, if that, you know, if you don't, if you didn't uh, save my my kid, I'm I'm not going to serve you." A lot, a lot of people have done that in life. Now, also, God tests us by specific instructions. Sometimes, let's just I'm going to go through a few of them. We may not read every passage. One we've already discussed, God told the people of Israel that he gave them manna to test them, originally. But you remember, God gave them very specific instructions. They weren't to take more than a person could eat in a day. And then on, the, on Friday, how much were they to take? Twice the amount. Well, uh, and God gave them those specific instructions because on, on the Sabbath, some of the Jews went out to find the manna. And God was not happy with them because I told you, now you're going to go hungry all day because I told you to take twice as much and it, it wouldn't. Now, if they took too much, what happened to it? It became wormy. <laughs> if, they, if, they, you know, if they were going to be a glutton about it, then they'd open it up and, and it was all full of worms. <laughs> God has a sense of humor, folks. Don't you think God does not have a sense of humor? Now, uh, then the next one uh, in, is uh, when Moses was told by God, this is called Meribah, God, Moses was told by God to speak to the rock. Now, every other time, God told Moses to take your staff, Moses' staff, even remember at the burning bush, God says, what's in your hand? He says, staff, throw it down. What happened to it? Caleb. Oh, Caleb's gone. This is Caleb's favorite Bible story. What happened to it? Turn it to a snake. Turn it to a snake. And, of course, Moses did what all of you would do. He ran. And then God said, no, go back. Pick it up by the tail. And it turned back into a staff. <clears throat> and, and so Moses' staff was kind of like his security blanket, if you will. And he would hit the rock, and several times he hit the rock with the staff, etc. But this time God says to Moses, speak to the rock. What did he do? He hit it. He didn't honor God as holy, and he struck the rock. Now God still brought the water forth, but God said, because you didn't Honor me as holy, you're not going to get to go into the land. And Moses later says three times, I asked the Lord to change his mind. <coughs> and the Lord said, don't ask me again. You're not going in. So, <clears throat> sometimes God's instructions are a test. There's one other uh, I want to give. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 13. We'll read this one because this is a very interesting story. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 13. <laughs> this is the story of the altar and God uh, called a prophet to go cry out against an altar you remember Jeroboam 
Jeroboam was a very hard-working, industrious, and responsible man. And Solomon didn't like him. And he had to flee to Egypt because Solomon was going to kill him. Well, once Solomon died, he came back and asked Solomon's son, Rehoboam, to lower the taxes. This sounds very contemporary, doesn't it? What did Donald Trump, what's one of the crowning jewels of Donald Trump's presidency? He lowered taxes. So, uh, Rehoboam, this is a good lesson for you young people. Watch out for peer pressure. Don't take advice from anybody your own age. They're, if you're too stupid to know, they're certainly too stupid to know. So, Jeroboam came back and said, lower the taxes. So Rehoboam, the Bible says, went to the elders of Israel and said, what should I do? The people, have, they, you know, they've said thus and thus, and they said, lower the taxes. Then the Bible says, he went to the young men that he grew up with, and he said, the people have said thus and thus, what should I do? What, what, did, what, did, he, what did they say to him? They all remember? Yeah, make it harder. Yeah. He says, you tell the people, my little finger is thicker than my father's thigh. Well, that's kind of a parable that means if yeah. you think my father taxed you, you haven't seen nothing yet. And the Bible says because of that, Rehoboam, Jeroboam walked away and took ten tribes with him away from Solomon's son. He only got left with two, Benjamin and Judah. So great lesson. Basically, that's what happened. In this election, last election in 2016, the tax rates were so horribly high that people said, we've had enough of this. We want somebody who's going to lower our taxes. And uh, so Jeroboam, though, was not a good guy. He could have, but he was afraid the people would go back to Israel and become loyal to the king. So he set up two golden calves, two calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, and said, These, O Israel, be thy God. And then in chapter 13, God, he had set up an altar in Bethel, remember by this calf. Behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. Set up his own religion. He cried, verse 2, against the altar by the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places, who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. By the way, that actually happened. You can read it under Josiah's reign. He actually did it. This is a case, Jesse, we were talking about this morning that God, God knows what's going to happen in the future because He's going to make it happen. And He's going to make sure that this baby that's born is named Jo... Is it Jo... Joash? Jo... Josiah. Right? So he does, God's going to make that happen. And by the way, that's not going to affect anybody's salvation. God can do that without any problem and forcing somebody to be saved or lost. Everybody got that? I want to make that very clear. Then he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes... In other words, how do you know this is going to come true? Because the altar is going to split in two, and the ashes uh, which are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried out against the altar in Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying to his guards, Seize him! But his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so that he could not draw it back to himself. My neighbor across the street was a World War II vet who'd gotten shot in his arm, and he had an arm like that. He owned a paint store. Verse 5, The altar was also split apart, and the ashes were poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of God. And the king said to the man of God, please, he begged him, entreat the Lord your God, notice he says your God, not my God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God entreated the Lord. He was a kind, merciful man. And the king's hand was restored to him and it became as it was before. 
And then, of course, you know the story. The king invites him, Cole, come, come and eat at my house. He, he says, no, he leaves. Because the Lord had commanded him, he said, verse 9, For Saul was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat, nor drink water, nor return by the way which you came. Well, an old prophet sent word to him and said, Oh, an angel appeared to me and said, Come back and stay with me. And he disobeyed. He failed the test. He went back. And he didn't just stay one day or two days. He stayed three days, feasting and eating, talking with this old prophet, who claimed that an angel appeared to him. And what happened, David? Remember? He went, he went to leave, and a lion came out of the woods and killed him. Mm -hmm. Because he failed the test. So folks, when God tells you to do something, do it. Someone says, oh, that would never happen today. I'm not willing to uh, take that risk. I don't know about you. Remember what happened to Jonah when he didn't do what God told him to do. That's right. Now he lived through it, but... Spending three days in the belly of a fish is not my idea of a vacation. Mm -mm. So, we're tested by specific instructions from God. And you better obey, folks. If God tells you to do something, do it. We're also uh, tested by personal invitation. Turn to Psalm 26, verse 2. Psalm 26, verse 2. In other words... Sometimes we may ask God, God, test me. I want to be tested, Lord. Someone says, are you out of your mind? God's liable to do it. That's right. Don't ask God to test you if you aren't willing to be tested. Psalm 26, verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. We might say heart motive, right? Test my heart motive. David wanted to be tested to prove to God that he was the real deal. Now we're also um, tested by divine design. God intends to have a relationship with man. This is by design. God didn't make man for him to live apart from God, but to live in relationship with God, to have a walk with God, to fellowship back and forth, God and man. That's why that's our whole design parameter. And of course, part of that experience, any, any relationship, is uh, testing, searching. Turn to Jeremiah. There's two verses in Jeremiah that point this out. Chapter 17. Jeremiah, it's after Psalms, chapter 17. Verse 10. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways. Why does God test us? So he can reward us. Got it? Sometimes we think a test is a negative, but here a test is a positive. To give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Remember, you're going to be judged on Judgment Day, not by your motive, but by your deeds done in the flesh. This is everywhere, Old Testament and New Testament. Then chapter 20, verse 12. This theme is repeated again. Chapter 20, verse 12. Yet, O Lord of hosts... Now, this is Jeremiah... Praying. Yet, yet, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, who see the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on the them, the wicked, the, the Babylonians and the wicked, for to you I have set forth my cause. Now remember, Jeremiah was terribly persecuted by the Jews, actually. He was treated pretty nicely by the Babylonians, but he was he was persecuted by the Jews. They threw. Remember when they threw him down in a dry cistern? But it had, of course, it had mud in the bottom of it. 
And then an Ethiopian eunuch had mercy on him. Ebed Melik was his name. And he went to the king and said, Hey, they got, Jeremiah's going to die down there if you don't get him out. He's in the, it was in the king's courtyard where this cistern was. So he says he went down, and this, I love the Bible, this is one of the proofs the Bible is really true. They went down and got a bunch of old rags down in the basement of the palace, and they tied them all together, because I'm sure he was bony, and he, you know, if they'd put a rope under his arms, who knows what it would have done. So they put, he said, put these under your arms, and we'll pull you out with these, these bed sheets, because it'd be a little more easier to pull him out. So Jeremiah uh, says, you who test the righteous. So God, it's by design that God's going to test us. Amen? Now, when we are tested, well, the purpose of a test is not knowing when you're going to be tested, right? Now, sometimes teachers will announce, okay, we're going to have a midterm test and we're going to have a final exam. But in the meantime, we used to have what was called pop quizzes. Just a test would happen right in the middle of a class. I might stop and say, okay, we're going to take out a piece of paper and a pencil. You're going to have a pop quiz. Because maybe somebody wasn't paying attention in the back of the room. The professor wanted to embarrass them. So the purpose of a test is not knowing many times that you're going to be tested. And uh, I remember in college we used to kind of goof around. And then the night before the big exam, what would we do? We'd cram all night long to try to pass the test. Not like you, Linda. You studied faithfully every night. And were very. I'm sure you were, knowing you, you were very studious. But not some of us crazy guys. We didn't pay attention like we should have. And uh, we again, one thing about a test, if you're not prepared, it's too late. You know what I mean? If you get caught in a situation and you said, oh, why didn't I study, it's too late. There's no way you're going to pass. So that's why you have to be prepared all the time. Now, what constitutes pass or fail? Bill mentioned this, I think, the first Sunday that we started talking about everything is a test. God doesn't grade on a curve, folks. There isn't A, B, C, D, E, and F. It's either pass or fail. This is a very important point. So what constitutes pass or fail? Well, from our text, Paul says, everything depends on whether Christ is in us. That's everything. Now, someone says, well, what, where does he have to be in me? You know, this whole idea. Can, can I just have a mental picture or a mental idea that Christ is the... No. Really, it has to be in our hearts, doesn't it? Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Christ has to be a be identified. We have to identify with Him. Christ has to be in us. This is the important test. Now, if you if you're here this morning and you say I fail, I would fail the test if I had to stand before God today, and God would say. Is Christ in you? I'd fail the test. And what, what, how do you remedy that? Well, God does have a way out. Now, while you're on earth, you can remedy it by repenting and saying, God, I haven't made you the, the king of my life. You aren't in me. I just have a mental picture of you. I just... I have maybe I have some sentimental feelings, you know, because I, I think about the cross and how terrible your life was. But you're really not the Lord of my life. Now you can remedy that today, right now. If if you're not right with God this morning, remember everything is a test. And it's pass or fail. And like we've said many times, you could walk out of this building today, get in your car and not make it home. Any one of us. I mean, we got a testimony that a 19-year-old girl, 20-year-old girl, just died last week. Mm. So the idea, oh, I, I'm young, I'll, I'll, no problem, I'll live forever. No, don't, don't do that, folks. Make sure you're right with God. You know, Amen. In verse 7, it says what it is to pass the test. Go ahead. Verse 7, it says, Now we pray to God. This is 2 Corinthians yeah, 13. Go back to 2 Corinthians 13, our original okay. passage. Dave's going to read verse 7. It is a very good verse. It's a very important verse. For a conclu great conclusion. 13, verse 7. 
wait a minute. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 13, last chapter in that book. Okay. 13 verse 7. Uh -huh. Okay. It says, Now we pray to God that you do no, no wrong. wrong. Not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we should appear unapproved. That's right. So the passing of the test is that you do what is right. Right. Not because you want the approval of men, or that because you because it's the right thing to do. Amen. In other words, we do it because it's what God commands us to do. Do what's right. Do what's right. All right. That's the end of that message. Now I'm going to begin. I preached this in 2000. What the, oh boy. I'll just introduce this message this morning. All right. Just to kind of get your wet your whistle. I uh, actually wrote this paper probably 20, 15, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and I preached this message in 2010, Roy. So only a, we probably only had like eight people at that time in our church. We were, it was pretty we sparse. Yeah, we were in the house. Actually, we were in the house in this time. And the title of this sermon is Avoiding the Potholes mm -hmm. on the Highway of Holiness. What's a pothole? We don't have, by the way, this year, because we haven't had a lot of bad weather, and the plows haven't been, there's not really, I mean, we've had some bad ones somewhere where you're afraid your car was going to get swallowed yes. up in some of them. But a pothole is a, it's interesting, it's a, hole, it's, a, it's a hole about the size of a pot. That's probably where that expression came from. And it's a big, uh, it's a big chunk of the pavement that has been probably a plow truck or, or cars hitting it constantly, has chipped away and made this large depression. And if you ever hit one of those full speed folks, it'll it'll jar the teeth out of your mouth. I'm the telling you. Car, I've actually the had my, my teeth whacked together the kit in a pothole and it can damage your automobile. Yes. Uh, lots of people have had suspension damage, etc., because of hitting a pothole. Turn to Isaiah chapter thirty five and then we'll close after we read this verse. Yeah. Isaiah thirty five, beginning at verse eight. I love this verse. I, I can hardly... This is a great verse. This whole passage is a great passage. Isaiah 35, verse 8. 35, verse 8. Now, it begins with, A highway will be there. Now, the there refers to wilderness. Eight. Or, yeah, verse 8. 35, verse 8. A highway will be there. So if you read verse 1, you'll see that he's talking about will, what's going to happen in the wilderness. Okay, Wilderness to us would be a there desert place, like, you know, verse up there eight. in the badlands of North Dakota, if you've ever driven through there. It's kind of like, there's just nothing there. It's, there's some pretty rocks and stuff, but not much there. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the Highway of Holiness. Some might say, well, all you ever talk about, Dave, is not sinning. All you ever talk about is holiness. I, I actually sat on the couch while I was praying for you this morning. I thought, you know, Lord, that's pretty much what I preach all the time. But when you find verses like this in the Bible, it's kind of hard to say, well, it's not that important. The highway will be there, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way. What way? The way of holiness. Mm -hmm. To he who walks uprightly, to he who lives without a sinful life, he who has committed himself to serve God with all his heart, that's who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it. Why? Well, they don't want to get up on the highway of holiness. They can't stand to be around holy people. They can't tolerate people who live a Christian life. Verse 9. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there. 
but the redeemed will walk there. Mm. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The highway of holiness. Now how do we avoid the potholes that are on that highway? Will there be potholes? Oh yeah, there's because that that's on we're that walk, we're walking on the narrow way now, aren't we? But yeah. if you remember the story of Pilgrim's Progress, there's all kinds of potholes, if you will. I'm using that figuratively, of course. There's all kinds of things that are going to be thrown down in front of us to try to get us off the course. <laughs> Amen. So this these what what this message is going to involve is twelve influences that I call potholes that we must avoid as Christians. And they're they're practical. I have a I have a biblical example for every one of these twelve influences. Okay? okay. So we'll start there next week and talk about avoiding the potholes on the highway of holiness. And by the way, folks, I hope you're on that highway this morning. Me too. I hope you're walking with God and obeying his commands. It's not it's not hard. You know, God's Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. My, my burden is easy. My load is light. I, I'm not asking you to do difficult things. I'm just asking you to obey this simple command to love God first and love your neighbor second. Amen? As yourself. Not, not hard. Father, we thank you this morning for this time together.